Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano. I'm a Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. And today we are welcoming our guests, Yul Kendi um, Valdez, co-founder and CEO of Forefront. Hi, how's it going? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Of course, we're excited to welcome you on today. If we could just jump in and tell us a little bit about yourself and your pronouns. Yes. Hello, saludos. My name is Yulkendi Valdez, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm Afro-Latina, Caribbean at heart from the Dominican Republic, who grew up in the Midwest, St. Louis, Missouri, to be exact, and now is a proud Northeastern. So talk about diverse perspectives. My grandma says it best. I'm a, you know, you can think of me as a quilt, a patchwork of multiple identities that I'm proud to bring to the table every day. Amazing. And what is one word that uh, describes how you're feeling right now? Um, optimistic, I would say. So why are you feeling optimistic? You know, I think um, in this day and time, is, is, it's good to talk about culture. I think we're finally ready to understand what it really means to build a culture that works for everyone. And I'm excited about the future. Amazing. I am also excited about the future and just a lot of optimism for folks who are doing the really good work out there as well, um, which brings us to kind of your business around Forefront. What is Forefront for folks who are listening and why did you start it? Yeah, you know, I run a company called Forefront. We're a training company for the future of work. And when I say future of work, uh, we're not only talking about remote work or technology, we're really talking about the people and the amazing demographic shifts that are happening. So the millennials and Gen Zers who are making up the majority of the workforce and are the most diverse generation. So 36% of the workforce is already Gen Z and almost half of them identify as people of color. So we work with employers, city agencies and nonprofits to provide workshops, webinar, public speaking to help build better equitable processes that fit the needs of this younger generations. And we also run more traditional training on racial equity, gender equity, implicit bias, microaggressions, and so on. So we have a lot of fun at Forefront, really trying to have brave conversations about who we are and who we need to be to build a better workplace. That's amazing. What inspired you to have these brave conversations and kind of fill the gap in um, like services to, for this kind of problem we are seeing with a lot of folks who really want these types of trainings and access to resources as well? Yeah, so on July 5th, 2016, I experienced what many called a moment of obligation. Uh, this was a very important day for me. I was close to a performance review uh, as I was being considered for a full-time role at the consulting firm that I was interning at. So this was before my senior year of college. Um, so what should have been a day full of bliss and opportunity regarding my career became really traumatic. So on my way to work, I heard about the death of the murder, better said of Alton Sterling out of Baton Rouge, another black man being killed by the police. I remember crying very visibly at work and not having anyone to speak about what I was feeling. And at that moment, I committed myself to designing a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable culture where anybody that had to go something to go, go through something like that could have a place to go, especially if more people like me are going to make the majority of the, of the workplace. So that really was my moment of obligation and duty to join this work. Yeah, I mean, that's really, that's a really impactful personal experience. And I do want to acknowledge and thank you for sharing that vulnerability with us kind of here today on, on the podcast as well. Um, I would love to know kind of what kind of problems and just like kind of questions employers have been um, like asking Forefront and you to help solve at their organizations, especially after the last um, couple like six months and also a year since we've been in COVID and we've seen so many folks um, and organizations really want to participate in the corporate social justice movement and figure out how to really support employees during um, this time. Yeah, you know, I want to start answering this question by, by recognizing um, 
the people on the ground that are being really resilient, brave, and holding themselves accountable right now at this moment in time. So, you know, we, we often talk about, um, you know, the, the bad and the ugly as it regards to this work, but there are a lot of people that do want to do the work, um, but high level, the culture is not giving them the resources to mm-hmm. do it. You know, uh, they're still fighting to get that leadership buy-in, which is so critical right. uh, to move and, you know, this might be people that are already in HR, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, mm-hmm. or work um, in employee resource groups, or it might just be people that make this a second job just because they care, you know, and, and it is a ver- very selfless thing to do, to do culture work, to be change makers, because we often hear that that might not be beneficial uh, for one's career, to be honest, right? That that takes you away from your main work. But these people on the ground, these heroes, see this as important. And we wouldn't be here um, at this point if it weren't for those people. So I, so I want to start there. But in terms of, you know, what we hear generally, one, there's no pipeline uh, for, for Black and, and Latinx talent, especially um, especially when thinking about technical roles. We know, by, by this point, we know that's a myth. The mm-hmm. talent is out there, it's just there's not a lot of intentionality in finding them yet. So the question is, how do we recruit this talent? And once we recruit them, how do we retain them? So they're noticing a lot of turnover numbers, uh, lack of engagement numbers. And then at the top, the leadership itself is, is not diverse. And then the existing leadership is not trained enough, is not really bought in enough, and doesn't yet understand how this work truly, truly can impact their their bottom line. So what we see is an entire talent system in flux, and a lot of people, a lot of organizations are just wondering where they can get started. And, And that's why often we're starting this work from a place of fear when we shouldn't have to. Yeah, and I love that you brought up the fact that a lot of folks want to be intentional about it, and that's why they're asking you for advice and expertise as well. How can you start being really intentional and meaningful with these solutions and really long-term strategies? We know change doesn't happen overnight, but what is the difference between putting together you know, a reactive strategy as opposed to really thinking about the full picture of supporting employees and also um, you know, attracting and retaining diverse talent as well? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and, you know, the right way is holistic, is comprehensive. It starts with a lot of why questions, yeah. even though to those questions, you know, hurt, even if it means that, hey, we didn't get everything right the first time. So it, it's really doing an audit of the entire employee experience, right? If we have a entire system that's in flux, we got to overthrow it. We let it undesign it, redesign it, start over. And that's scary, right? To have that humility to say, hey, we, we, we might need to do this again if, if we want to set ourselves up for the future. But the reality is that is the work that we need to do. So I, I, I do recommend starting with that audit and understanding how do we currently hire? How do we currently retain and advance our talent and realize that you know, many of the systems are in place are just preferences and traditions that no longer serve us. And what we need to uh, a lot for is what are actual requirements? What do we actually need versus things that we just got comfortable doing? You know, Mm -hmm. we got comfortable with asking for a resume or a CV. We got comfortable for um, asking uh, for certain amount of recommendations or 10 to 15 years of experience. We got comfortable um, asking for a college degree for jobs that don't even need a four-year traditional program. And I know those are very radical things to talk about, but it's important to to really start there and understanding the, the entire system we operate on and realize that, again, Many of these things are just based on biases and preferences that we hold versus what we actually need to run a successful organization. And once actually collecting the data and understanding, um, you know, why things are the way they are, building the right action plan um, around it. 
the wrong way to do it is just to host a company wide unconscious bias training and, and call <laughs> it. A- yeah. Or absolutely. yeah, like we're going to talk about maybe later, uh, writing a statement saying black lives matter or stop Asian hate. And then, um, you know, getting a few likes and calling it a day. That's, that's not good. Yes, that is not what we would call a holistic strategy at all, um, and also not a proactive uh, approach to this kind of this kind of work as well. And what you brought up as well in terms of biases and everybody bringing their own experiences with them to work, and it is kind of radical if you're talking about uprooting a system, especially a culture um, in an organization that a lot of folks are comfortable with, and then you have new people joining, and then you're starting kind of these new traditions, these new norms. What are your thoughts around creating a really engaging like employee experience for all employees while meeting folks where they are, recognizing that everyone is in a different part of the process and also just coming in with these different uh, lived experiences? Yeah, no, uh, you know, employees wanna be seen, heard and valued. Uh, data tells us that employees who are silent feel censorship, especially in topics of race or what's going on in the world politics, feel 13 times more as disengaged than their counterparts. So this has a direct impact on their engagement and also their willingness to leave, right? If they feel they cannot talk about things that impact their identities and their communities, they're three times more likely to quit, right? So the numbers speak for themselves. So if we want true employee engagement, we must include agency, employee advocacy, mentorship, sponsorship, career development, upward mobility, affinity groups, mental health, workplace flexibility, feedback loops, healthy reciprocal feedback loops, community engagement, most important, radical transparency. Right, those are a lot of things, uh, but are equally important. And each and every one employee needs those things. And I think it's gonna start happening the more that CSR, philanthropy departments, diversity teams, HR, learning and development, and now the new office around well-being and emotional well-being start collaborating more actively to create a really. Um, fruitful employee experience that works for all. Yeah, there are many kind of different stakeholders that work in the company for employees, but I like how you mentioned the CSR and social impact portion as well of just an organization's involvement in the community and, you know, thinking really intentionally about the strategy there too. Um, I did watch your TED talk um, where you talked about the importance of representation and you just mentioned it as in the ingredients of really important strategies too. Um, How do you advise leaders and just folks who are managers and in the C-suite to think about inclusive leadership and authentic inclusive leadership as well, especially if they're not there yet? Yeah, no, and I'm glad you brought up the research with women of color in tech um, because I carry their stories and, and their narratives um, with me. And and you think inclusive leadership is easy, but then you talk to these women, oral stories that they experience, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, uh, uh, even the minimal, when we talk about feedback, that sounds easy. Everybody gets feedback. Well, no, they don't. Yeah. Uh, women of color fight for that feedback, they have to fight to get it documented in writing, even if it's like one, um, you know, good thing that that they did, they don't have that agency. Often, when they speak up in meetings, um, it it has the opposite results, or they're too aggressive, they're, 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 they're too angry. So um, my first thing to leaders is, hey, it's it's not really that easy, it's gonna take work and practice just like any other um, leadership acumen. And so for me, inclusive leadership is really about humility, resilience, and authenticity, you know? And something I say is that I recommend leaders start with who and not with why. I like the whole purposeful leaders movement. It's cool and all. It's all, you know, purposeful leaders leave a legacy of impact for themselves and the company at large. That's, That's great. 
but inclusive leaders take it an extra level. They leave a legacy by others for others. They think about who. They think about who they are and how they play in a system of privilege and oppression. And they think about who they should bring to the table, not only to, to get a seat and take notes in the background, but to grab the mic and take center stage. They see those opportunities and they provide that platform. So in return, inclusive leaders drive more engagement. They create better cultures and also foster more productive employees. That's good for money at the end of the day. So um, I suggest our leaders to really start with who uh, moving forward. Yeah, and I love that piece around kind of leading by example, modeling, but also building something that is bigger than yourself. I think that's a huge accomplishment when you kind of empower others as well. That's the word to kind of think about their privilege, think about the decisions that they're making to also be inclusive leaders, no matter if they are managers, if they're individual contributors as well, because that is a huge cultural change and contributes to people and folks at an organization feeling like they belong and that they can thrive in the organization, which again, like you said, is good for the bottom line um, as well. So definitely want to dive into the other point that you made too around company statements. We've been seeing so many of them lately, which is, you know, I definitely appreciate seeing support for Black Lives Matter, for, uh, you know, solidarity statements for the AAPI community and stopping Asian hate, but there is a difference, like you said, between performative statements and not really supporting employees and, you know, like really holistic strategies. What is your kind of thought around building that intentionality behind it and what really is meaningful there? You know, I would say it's progress, though. Uh, not long ago, many employers couldn't even say the, the, the three words, Black Lives Matter, because um, they didn't understand what was the meaning behind that movement. So the fact that they're saying it now and at least putting a poster, it shows that at least they're more, there's more open window to learn and for curiosity. Absolutely. And um, with Stop hate, Asian Hate, the reality is that probably a few weeks ago is, is, is something that none of these companies were worrying about, yeah. you know, and, and that's intentional. We hear the model minority myth. We hear about, you know, the way race was designed. That's intentional. So this is a good time to really speak about the nuances of our experiences, the nuances of the Asian experience. Um, um, So hopefully, again, that gets us to a a place of curiosity. So it was a a nice first step. And data says that statements are good. You know, Harvard Business Review says that millennials love this. They love when their CEO um, backs a social justice cause that they care about. And it actually makes millennials be more loyal to that company. However, it just doesn't account for anything unless it's backed by an action plan, a blueprint for social justice. So after posting that statement, did you actually start changing the way you hire? Did you actually provide resources for your employees Mm -hmm. to talk about feeling? Did you actually invest in more coaching, training for your leadership and and managers to break down these movements and understand how they can support? That's really what has backing and that's really what's going to have ROI as it regards to, to your culture. Yeah, having some action behind the words and really thinking about this moving forward after a couple months and after a couple years, what are you yeah. what are you going to do about it? So, and I definitely think that we have seen a lot of progress, which is great, and there's more more to be done too. And you mentioned millennials, and I saw kind of in your work you work with the future of work for millennials and Gen Zers. Are there any differences between the the workforces and just having those intergenerational conversations? How do you see that manifesting in the workplace and what what kind of conversations need to be to be had there in order for people to thrive at work? Yeah, so for Gen Zers, especially the number one thing they care about right now is racial equity. You know, isn't isn't that amazing that yeah. out of all the we're we're dealing with 
this is top in mind for everyone. And I don't mean just Gen Zers of color. These include white Gen Zers as well. Yeah. They care about. Them. So if this if racial equity is not at the forefront of your company's culture and the way you're driving change, you're going to miss out on great employees and also great customers. But beyond that, there's also a lot of similarities to talk about. Um, you know, there's a lot of myths. Uh, about Gen Zers and millennials. They're job hoppers. They're just going to leave the next thing because they want to change the world. They're idealists. But when you actually look at the research by Deloitte, who comes out with, with the millennial research every year, we see that these younger generations crave the same stability, the same type of psychological safety, the same yeah. financial security that many previous generations do. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, you know, under account for that. Uh, we still need to provide holistic support for them just as much as we did um, for, for previous generations. Yeah, I don't buy into those stereotypes that they're job hoppers. And that's interesting that the number one cause or something that they're interested in for an employer also is racial equity. And you do bring up the term psychological safety. That's something that we deeply care about at All Voices, but also something that a lot of employers, trainers, and folks who are offering workshops as well are talking about. What is really psychological safety in your in your mind and defining that? Yeah, you know, um, I think more about how long term we we should be providing psychological safety because one thing is is to have a very reactive um uh, strategy to it like again waiting for something to happen like for me for example i talked about why i ended up quitting my company uh and it was when i heard about the death of alton sternley mm -hmm. and the reason I me is because I mentioned I grew up in Missouri. So I went to uh, schools in the, in the Ferguson School District. And now Ferguson is also known for the murder of Michael Brown. That's 10 minutes from where I live. Mm -hmm. And same thought kept circulating in my head. That could have been any of my younger brothers. So I lived with that. And not having anyone to turn to talk about these things was, was, was really hard. So yes, we can have that one brace Space, safe space conversation, that one open forum once a month, um, but that's not enough. So the future calls for 24-7 access to emotional well-being facilitated by professionals, by coaches, by mental health professionals that are there for employees to, to help them navigate the different things that pop up. And it's connected also to the work you do, different mechanisms to anonymously report and quantify both positive and negative interactions that employees have day to day. Because the more we can collect data on what actually that employee experiences, the more we can uh, really predict for it and fix those very root issues. And so for me at the core, mental well-being resources uh, should be at the forefront of this conversation around psychological safety you know, I, I wish I had the person, I, I wish I had someone to talk to about what I was feeling, but the reality, my colleagues or your colleagues are dealing with, with very similar things. We cannot always rely on each other. So it's the company's responsibility to provide that uh, continuous framework for, for support. Yeah, support is is really important. And I think it speaks a lot to the organization when they do offer that and they recognize that you are a full person outside of work. And these are things that are happening in the world and they're so intertwined with the workforce. I do have a question to ask you because it has been coming up in conversations where employees definitely want to be supportive to their team members. So when terrible murders and like things are happening in the world that they know employees and their team members are also experiencing uh, this type of trauma. What kind of words from employees are a little bit like more helpful um, than just saying like thinking of you or just like, I know during, um, during a lot, you know, during this time, there are a lot of folks who do want to 
reach out to friends or colleagues, but they're just like, I don't know what to say. Um, so I just wanted to ask your opinion in terms of what was most helpful um, when you were processing like Alton Brown and um, Alton Sterling, excuse me, and Michael Brown's uh, murder. Yeah, I think back when I talked about Alton Sterling, that was, that was 2016. Mm -hmm. um, I remember someone took me on a walk and just listened. Um, you know, this wasn't anybody on leadership or a manager role, just someone that I thought what was struggling. So if you can do something like that, you say, do you want to go to walk? Um, but just listen, you know, be in a place um, where you're providing just that space to be there for someone and have that, that empathy. Um, I think more recently now with the murder of George Floyd, um, I think a lot of more people wanted to to either send those texts or, or those emails or those phone calls. Um, but I think what we need to watch out for is to immediately um, uh, politicize an incident when you're talking about real human beings. So as much as we want to be for the cause and ready to jump in, just remember at that moment that that is so personal to a to someone that that grew up in a similar community or is from that background that you you can't have that conversation right away you just got to give them that time to heal and be there so that would be the one kind of thing to consider for those that want to help like keep it on the personal note don't jump right away to um to the kind of social justice um politics part of the discussion. Yeah, I think that's definitely really helpful in terms of creating creating that space and actively and empathetically listening as well. Do you, and we've mentioned this um, in our conversation too, but do you believe in the uh, saying like bring your full self to work or do you think that's more of an idealistic view of the workplace? Do you think we'll eventually get there? I know it's different for every for everyone. Yeah, no, I, 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 I believe it, um, but some might not even want to. But what's important here is, is, again, choice, agency. The more flexible our, our policies are, the more we allow employees to make decisions for how they want to show up and what they actually need to thrive at work, the better. You know, it's not one fit all. Remember, equity doesn't mean equality. Mm -hmm. We do not by everybody the same thing. But if they have the choice, especially when identities are so fluid, right? You might not feel to bring out a part of yourself in, in year one, but in year three, you are in a different part of your personal journey and you would yeah. like to bring that to, to your work. So that's, you know, in an ever-changing world, that's why it's so important to at least have a culture where you have the option to, but also understand that not everybody uh, would want to because of their personality, work style, and it's not just what they need uh, to thrive at work. For me, I needed, I identify that I needed curly hair to thrive at work, so I, I let yes. go of, of of my straight hair, which I only had because I thought I was taught that it was professional. Mm -hmm. Is it really, again, what's required versus what's actually a preference? So that's also part of the conversation of um, as we talked about really auditing the current systems and understanding why things are the way they are. Yeah, get to the get to the why and why are we doing things the same the same way we've been doing it. If it's just because, well, that's the way we've been doing it for X many years, maybe, you know, definitely time to start reevaluating. Um, I would also like to know in this work, it's really, it's really emotional. It is a lot of emotional labor. It's a lot of uh, kind of active you know, education, and I would like to know what is one of your most rewarding uh, moments, either with companies or on an individual level. Yeah, um, talking to young professionals of color, students, you know, they're ready to be your next CEO, board members, venture back tech founders. There's no lack of ambition out there, you know, regardless of what we might hear. So it's just super rewarding that I can do my part to hopefully build better systems that actually 
give them the resources they need to build um, to build their dreams, right? And and my goal, no one no one should quit a job because they didn't feel seen or heard. Um, you know, so my motivation. I have younger siblings. I want his first job um, to be a place where there is psychological safety, where there is agency. Where they where it's where it's run by inclusive leaders, so that's my main motivation and what makes it most rewarding. That's amazing. I love it. Is there any way? How can folks get in touch with you if they have questions or learn more about Forefront? Yeah, I would love uh, follow me on on LinkedIn and let's continue the conversation. Just look up my uh, full name and also check us out uh, in our website at www.getforefront.co. Awesome. And then is there anything else you would like to share with the audience who's listening here right now? If it's like a takeaway from our conversation or it's just like something that you are thinking about that you definitely want uh, folks listening to, to know? Yeah, um, you know, this this work around reimagining company culture, it's it's hard and scary. Um, but remember, just like any other experiment, we're all in it together. Um, X stagnation is what we should worry about. We should just continue to get out there, try different things, move the needle forward, and day by day we'll get closer to build. Uh, that reality that the world seeking. So excited to join you all in, in this fight. Amazing. We are all in this together. No one is alone in this journey. And there are so many resources and folks out there who are doing amazing work like yourself. So thank you so much, uh, Yul Kendi, for coming on the show and for sharing your insights with us. We really appreciate it. Um, and we hope to speak with you soon. Information about uh, Forefront is in the bio as well. Um, and at All Voices, we believe in the empowerment of everyone to speak up and creating a place where employees feel they can speak up is a need to have in order for everyone to succeed. Um, have a good rest of your day and we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you, All Voices. Bye.